Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, this long-awaited meeting of the Higher Purpose Forum, uh, co-hosted with HJI International Graduate School for Peace and Public Leadership. It's a very important uh, topic we're initiating this morning, the discussion of justice, which has become a, a topic that's become quite divisive politically in our country for very important reasons. We're going to cover those reasons today, I, I hope. And uh, we're very grateful to uh, be, again, co-hosted by HGI International Graduate School. Before we begin our program, I'd just like to mention that I'm proud to report that I am a student in the graduate school, in, uh, HGI International Graduate School. I'm now in my fourth semester. It's been a source of great inspiration for me and personal growth. My opinion is that unificationism is a, is a movement of very important and uplifting ideas. And I am a student at HGI because I want to be part of the formulation of new ideas that are relevant for our, our country and our movement. And uh, I'm just giving a quick advertisement before we begin the program to all of you. If you're not involved with, in some way, the HGI community, taking at least one course on an experimental basis, I would definitely, for personal experience, encourage you to give it a try. Now, without further ado, we begin the program by turning it over to today's moderator. Uh, the leader of our Economic Democracy Initiative, Alan Jessen. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. It's nice to uh, be together with you all. And I want to second what Jim just said, because I, too, am a student. I've taken a class last semester at HJI, and, and it was uh, very, very exciting. So I want to share my screen, and, and we'll get with our program here today. <clears throat> from the beginning. So this is the uh, topic today, as you have seen in the in your uh, promotionals, the, the quest for justice. We have a main speaker, Dr. Thomas Walsh, which uh, I, I should say he, he this is a recorded talk he had to give. Oops, we're back uh, because he's uh, traveling to Korea. But uh, he'll be speaking. Our introductory speaker is James Edgerly on a simple context for new ideas of justice and economic democracy. So we're, let's get started here. Thank you very much. So the, today's, just want to mention about the, the topic areas of development within the Higher Purpose Forum, uh, race and province in America, justice and economic democracy, and the unity of science and religion. So we also want you to uh, mark your calendars. We are, uh, HAI is hosting its first International Conference on Peace and Public Leadership, scheduled for Thursday to Saturday, April 11th to the 13th. It'll be a virtual conference. Uh, you'll receive more communications about times and things like that. But as you see here, there are uh, seven different seven different uh, uh, topics. And ours is listed there, Economic Democracy is also one of the topics to be covered. So it should be exciting. We're looking forward to that. So take, make note. And uh, these are the ground rules. So we want you to be respectful. Of course, as always, uh, we, we're going to have a, uh, a Zoom discussion at the end, as we always do with, H with the Higher Purpose Forum. And you can use the Zoom to raise your hand function. We also have a chat uh, opportunity, and we have a chat moderator to help handle those um, issues. So the meeting is being recorded. And uh, before I introduce our speaker, I just want to mention also we have uh, two uh, people standing in for Dr. Walsh for the discussion section of our program, and that would be Dr. Thomas Ward, who's provost of HJI International Graduate School, and Dr. Um, Kisike Noda, who is a professor of philosophy and ethics. So they'll be helping us with the discussion part of the program. So let me, let me begin here with uh, introducing uh, Jim, our, our introductory speaker, to kind of set the table for tonight. Uh, Jim has a 35-year business career in restructuring troubled industrial companies. He was an owner and managing executive at the Recovery Group in Boston, Orion Ropeworks in Winslow, Maine, and the Biosol Company in Lexington, Massachusetts. Jim also has been active in ministry since 1973, including serving as senior pastor at the Boston Family Church. I had to shrink something here, excuse me. 
uh, from 9, 2004 to 2016. He founded the Higher Purpose Forum as 2019 as an independent educational and outreach project of unificationism. Jim earned a BA degree in political philosophy from the Columbia University and a Master of Science degree in management from the Sloan School of Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So Mr. Edgerly, uh, Jim, please uh, take it from here and, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, my topic today is uh, a simple context for new ideas in justice and economic democracy. And I'm uh, presenting this briefly today, it's just 10 slides, uh, as an introduction to Dr. Walsh's, uh, the main, main message today from Dr. Walsh. I think if you've uh, studied Marxism, you know a very important, a very important basic concept of Marxism is the fact, is this concept of the relationship between the base of a society and the superstructure. Uh, and this has its parallel in unificationism, which is very important, I think. Um, the base, according to Marxist theory, the base of a society is its economic means of production. And in our particular uh, uh, society, the Marxist would categories are, are the base of our societies being a capitalistic economic structure. And based upon or, or, or being derived from that, they would say is the superstructure of a society, which is determined by the base and includes everything that is not directly involved with production. And the structures in the aspects of the superstructure uh, serve to actually reinforce or maintain the existence of the economic base of the society. So this is, a this is the relation between base and superstructure, the base being the economic means of production and the superstructure being everything else that is determined by that economic structure and that maintains the base which supports it. The unification's worldview upon which our understanding of justice must be based is, I would say, in some ways, opposite. Based upon the ideas of the principle, uh, we understand the base or the internal uh, mind of society is the religious beliefs and values and ideals that motivate people and give meaning to their life and give purpose to their life and inspired or motivated by their religious and spiritual beliefs, a culture emerges. And out of that base of religion, the religious uh, context of society and the culture which emerges from it, economic and political structures emerge as a superstructure. And we could say those are in the relationship of external or, or body, the mind or the internal aspect of society being the religious values. So in one sense, the relationship we understand between economics and political system is similar to uh, the materialistic or Marxist view. We believe that the uh, political system is a reflection or is based upon the structure of the uh, excuse me, the economic system. So in a sense, there's a parallel understanding of the relationship between economics and politics, between uh, unificationism and materialism. Uh, but we understand those aspects as being superstructure and the religious internal aspects of the culture of the society, religion and culture being the basis of that superstructure. So religion is the basis of culture, Culture is expressed in the economic system. The economic system is reflected in the political system. We know uh, well from studying uh, in, uh, in uh, aspects of the principle, this reference in, in that study to the work of Arnold Toynbee in which he explains the relationship between religions and cultures and explain that there are basically four macro cultural spheres and each one of those is based upon the major religions. Uh, that have consolidated in the course of history. So in the United States, we have a particularly interesting alignment of base and superstructure. Very important uh, alignment uh, based upon the Judeo-Christian religious foundation, which has emphasized individual freedom and individual human history. We developed 
what uh, what religious historians would refer to as our Protestant cultural core. And in that cultural core, I would say is included our concepts and norms of justice. And from that Protestant cultural core emerged a certain kind of economy, a, a, what we would call a free market economy. We use that term instead of the capitalist economy because that's what it is. It's uh, the term capitalist economy is really a Marxist originated from Marxism and free market economy originated from the, the, the I, as I understand the writings of Adam Smith. And that's the best way I believe to characterize the economic structure of our country. And from that has emerged uh, as an expression of our economic relations, a certain kind of political system, which we call federalism and representative democracy. And so there's a cause and effect relationship here. We can see uh, that the reason for our meeting this, this, this afternoon, this evening, is to discuss a very dramatic source of growing system, systemic misalignment in our country based upon our economic system. And the basic issue that we're going to talk about today is what's emerged in the last, uh, I would say, since the 1970s, extreme wealth and income inequality. There are other aspects of this economic crisis. They're all related, uh, one of them being five decades of flat income to real for workers. There's been no real increase in, in, in earnings for workers during over the last five decades since the 1970s, even though worker productivity has increased steadily and dramatically during those five decades. There's excessive federal indebtedness. It's now reached uh, $33 trillion. And we've experienced and continue to experience repeated boom bust cycles. These actually, these economic characteristics that have emerged from the market, free market system in our country are very much interrelated with one another. And I would say that the core issue that's uh, a theme across all those areas of, uh, of disequilibrium is the problem of extreme wealth and income inequality. And this was predicted we know uh, as one of the laws of, ec of, of economic theory of Karl Marx, he referred to this direction that capitalism would take. He predicted it. He referred to it as the concentration of capital. And it seems to validate this, this, uh, this, this feature this, of our uh, economy seems, seems to validate Marxist theory. Just a brief, this is not a, a talk in economics. This is a, a talk to, uh, this is in, in the area, I guess, of philosophy, but not economics. But so we're just going to use a, a small illustration here. Uh, data from the Federal Reserve Bank from 2023. The total share of U.S. wealth held by the top 1% of the population represents 31.3% of the total wealth of the country. And that's estimated in 2023 to be 43 trillion dollars held by the top one percent of our population the next nine percent from two to ten percent holds 38 percent of the total wealth of our economy so that means the top 10 percent of our country controls 69 percent of the country's wealth the middle 40 percent control let's say 30 percent of total wealth and the bottom half control only 2.5% of the total wealth of our country, or $4 trillion. So it's a very, very top-heavy income distribution, to say the least. It's really extreme. There's no country in the world where the uh, malalignment of wealth is as extreme as it is in the United States. In, in fact, there's no country that's even close. The United States is an outlier in terms of wealth distribution. And we, we know that this concentration is actually going to increase considerably due to the impacts for a number of reasons we won't we won't discuss today. This increasing concentration will will continue due to the impacts on our economy of uh, artificial intelligence being brought into production processes and in the service sector. Here's another uh, quick uh, characterization of uh, wealth concentration in our country, share of stock ownership. This is was reported by CNBC in October 2021. 
The wealthiest 10% of American households own almost 90% of all U.S. stocks. The top 1% increased their wealth by over $6.5 trillion in uh, portfolio uh, equity portfolio wealth during the pandemic. The bottom 90% of Americans hold only about 11% of stocks and added $1.2 trillion in wealth during the pandemic. So we see a severe imbalance of, um, of prosperity and wealth in our country, which is not the way the country has been through most of its history. When the country was founded and its democratic principles were put in place, there was a very, a very um, egalitarian uh, distribution of wealth in the country. And there are very serious destabilizing political consequences of this highly concentrated capital ownership. It is pol politically destabilizing. And I'm just going to summarize this very big topic here, which is why we're talking today, because there's nothing wrong with people becoming wealthy, but it's 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 disturbing, severely disturbing to our, our political system. And we're witnessing that destabilization every day. Non-democratic concentration of political influence is emerging because of the power of lobbying organizations, political donations, political action committees, and interest groups. They have a very disproportionate impact upon our political system. There's a growing distrust of that we're, we're, we, uh, we have in our country a non-democratic or rigged political system, and it creates a sense of alienation people who no longer trust or identify with or uh, want to participate in a, in a political system which they believe is rigged against them. There's an increasing requirement or need for governmental infer, uh, intervention and indebtedness. And this is a pretty complicated issue. But basically, when you have uh, a huge maldistribution of consumer power it reduces the amount of demand in the economy. And so the government has to step in based upon the rationale of Keynesian economics, and they have to create demand by increasing the, the government, the, uh, the economic activity in the, in the country by spending money. And that's why we have so much public federal indebtedness, $33 trillion. And there's a fragmentation of society into disparate economic classes and they're disputing over their share of what they believe should be a government redistribution of wealth to favor disadvantaged groups. So these are all sources of uh, political destabilization as caused when you have extreme wealth in one end of the uh, one end of the populace and poverty in the other. There's 40 million Americans who are now living below the poverty line, and the poverty line is only $35 a day which is a very significant part of our population. It's actually, I would say, destitute. And as a result of this, there's a growing skepticism toward the underlying religious and cultural values of our country. People no longer believe that our country is rooted in fair and just religious and cultural values. And so this is discrediting the cultural and religious foundation upon which our country's been built. So this is my final slide. The hypothesis of our work, the Higher Purpose Forum, Higher Purpose Forum uh, work on justice and economic democracy is that change is needed within the free market economic system. Change is needed within our free market system to bring it back into alignment with our democratic political system. And that change must redress the core problem of the concentration of capital in the extreme disparities of wealth and income that we have in our country. There's nothing wrong with wealth, but it's destabilizing our political future. For a change in our economic system to be successful, it must be rooted in a deepening and, and a rejuvenation of our religious and cultural base. And for that reason, we propose a refinement or updating of our understanding of justice, specifically economic justice. So that's my introductory talk for today. Thank you for listening.
Thank you, Ellen. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Jim. Excellent. A lot of there to think about and uh, integrate those ideas. Um, you know, I was kind of interested in the, the one point you made that it validates Marx, Marx's criticism of alienation. And, uh, you know, that's kind of an amazing statement to think that uh, something stated, uh, you know, 150 years ago or something, uh, kind of a warning really, has kind of been more evident in these last uh, decades to see it in, in uh, you know, come to exist. And uh, I think it is creating a, a sense of alienation. Uh, is that where you, what, you, what your mind is at with that? Well, I don't really particularly like to validate uh, materialist uh, uh, <laughs> worldview. Yes. But there is some truth to that accusation. And our job is to create the counterproposal, the, the, the response to that in a way that is supportive of the, uh, the, the values and the identity of our country. Yeah. And then, of course, the base of our country is the, you know, freedom and human dignity. So uh, that's what we don't want to lose either as we try to solve our problems. It's, and it's being threatened by this very massive economic disequilibria. Well, we're going to proceed here. Thank you, Jim, again, for setting the stage. And we're going to invite Dr. Walsh to uh, give us his presentation that he uh, recorded for us. And uh, I'm going to just introduce Dr. Walsh here and then turn it over to, to his comments and his reflections. Uh, Dr. Walsh is the president of HJI Graduate School of Peace and Justice Studies. He's a 1979 graduate of HJI and earned his PhD in 1986 at Vanderbilt University's School of Religion, where he specialized in the study of religion and ethics. Uh, Dr. Walsh has taught courses in religion, philosophy, and ethics at a number of colleges and universities, including at HJI. Uh, he worked closely with HJI co-founders, Reverend Sun Myung Moon and Dr. Hak Jahan Moon in the establishment and in the leadership of the Universal Peace Federation, known as UPF. Most recently, he has served as the international chair of UPF, which holds a general consultative status with the United Nations Economic and Social Council, and which has active chapters in more than 120 countries. So he's an accomplished leader on the global stage and, and within uh, academic circles in this area of uh, ethics and philosophy and justice. So we welcome Dr. Walsh uh, to share with us. Thank you. Good evening and uh, welcome to this program uh, sponsored by HJI and the High Purpose Forum. Uh, I'm Thomas Walsh. I'm happy to uh, say a few words this evening. I know I've been preceded by my good friend, Mr. Jim Edgerly, and he shared with me uh, the slides he would present that uh, are kind of providing uh, some background on this what I call maybe a research project or research program uh, that goes under the name economic uh, democracy and seeks to get at the problem of inequality, which uh, plagues really all society and all societies and has been there, of course, from the beginning in, in human uh, history. Um, and I've since attending uh, a session of Higher Purpose Forum a couple of months ago, I've been in conversation with uh, both Jim Edgerly and, and Alan Jessen and uh, really applaud their work. And I'm glad they're uh, carrying this project forward as one of the areas of focus of uh, this series of, of webinars. Um, I will... Uh, talk a little bit uh, this evening about uh, John Rawls. Uh, I will share my screen. I have more slides than I can cover tonight. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, anyway, Rawls is a, a major figure in political philosophy and ethics. He, he's an American uh, philosopher. He's was uh, grew up in Baltimore. He uh, was an Episcopalian, 
he went to Princeton as an undergraduate. And when he finished Princeton, he was in, enlisted in World War II. He went back to Princeton to get a doctorate in uh, moral philosophy and uh, later upon graduating taught at major universities was was at Harvard I think for 25 years or so he died in uh, uh, 2002 and major books one was called The Theory of Justice that was uh, published in 1971 and was uh, profoundly uh, impactful shall we say at least in among what we could call public intellectuals, those intellectuals that were writing in a way for application to uh, society and politics and, and economics. Uh, he published a revision of the theory of justice in 2001 called Justice as Fairness, uh, a book called uh, Law of Peoples in 1999 that sought to apply the theory of justice to international uh, relations. Uh, and uh, 1995, he wrote a book called Political Liberalism, which included a section called Reply to Jürgen Habermas, published in 1995. A uh, book came out a couple of years ago by Katrina Forrester called In the Shadow of Justice. It could have been titled In the Shadow of, of Roles in His Impact published 2019, among other things, mentions about 3,000 books and articles written about Rawls and his theory of justice. He's had significant uh, discussions uh, with other public intellectuals like Michael Sandel, also at Harvard, Robert uh, Nozick, Jürgen Habermas, a German uh, social philosopher, Robert Dworkin, and discussions with theologians, as I'll mention here, that in his undergraduate years, he was uh, very much involved in in uh, theology and uh, influenced at that time by a theological movement. And this is maybe addressed more to our HJI uh, theologians, but uh, neo-Orthodox theology. Some of you know the name Karl Barth, but uh, Reinhold Niebuhr in America was a major Christian theologian, Emil Brunner, uh, kind of a contemporary of Bart in Europe, uh, and uh, was a visiting professor at Princeton, uh, the Scandinavian theologian that wrote about uh, love, Christian love, as compared with, let's say, the classical idea of Platonic uh, philosophy of Eros versus agape love of Christianity, how agape uh, called for a certain kind of theory of justice. And neo-orthodoxy was coming out of an era of Christian great optimism uh, and hopes for a Christianization of society that would be a fair, just, wonderful society. And then World War I came along, and then World War II, which created a kind of strong shock and sense of what Niebuhr called realism and uh, a suspicion of utopianism or ideals of perfectionism, which were part of Christian uh, history. And uh, not only early Christianity or Reformation Christianity, but continues, but it called for something called Christian realism. And uh, they were kind of fellow travelers in a way, or fellow thinkers. Uh, Rawls wrote a senior thesis as an undergraduate called A Brief Inquiry in the Meaning of Sin and Faith, an Interpretation Based on the Concept of Community, published. Uh, well, it was written in 1942. It was not published. It was a senior uh, thesis. Um, later, after World War II, uh, Rawls had two brothers that died from, I think, diphtheria and uh, felt a certain kind of combination of of injustice or you know the the sadness tragic nature of that how could that happen and what was and i think an important word it meant called luck or fortune how come i survived john or jack rawls and my two brothers uh did not they of course learned about the holocaust in world war ii and uh these things impacted him 
uh, greatly and being involved in the war in the Pacific, in Papua New Guinea and Philippines, even went to Japan. So he eventually rejected his Christian underpinnings of his thought, but one could argue that they remained there in a secularized fashion. Uh, if we looked at, uh, and I've read some works about Rawls in terms of the, you know, the concept of theology and the justice of God uh, and how Christianity developed with that. And uh, is God bo- good? If so, how could he, uh, if God is good and all-powerful, how come our world is so filled with suffering? And there were divisions within early Christianity. This classic case is between uh, uh, St. Augustine and the, the monk Pelagius. And Augustine was more predestinarian and that we are saved by grace and Cosmic justice exists due to the fall, and uh, human beings deserved damnation, but God nevertheless intervenes with grace. Pelagius was more, you could say, maybe in some ways more Rawlsian. We have to work to create uh, justice. So Rawls was about establishing a theory of justice that can be agreed upon by citizens. So he's living in, you know, the 60s, the the uh, split in American society, the Vietnam War era, and people in the streets and demonstrations and civil rights movements and looking at, gee, there there is this great split between those that uh, are succeeding in society. They seem to benefit from it and uh, it's not all through their own uh, blood, sweat, and tears and their grit, but seem to have great advantages just by the luck of inheritance or circumstances. And others uh, have the opposite, opposite experience in life. So how can fair terms of cooperation among citizens that respect their rights and their duties be established and agreed upon? that would regulate the division of benefits, in other words, would help moderate, mitigate these extreme uh, differences of of wealth and uh, basic goods, uh, healthcare and and food and employment and housing. Uh, How can we uh, pull together so that there isn't this extreme gap? Why do we want to do this? Well, again, if you're living through instability and you see crime in the streets or demonstrations in the street, you know, you you start to see the need for stability and you see this cacophony of different perspectives and views, some more extreme, some more moderate. You see religious uh, perspectives that aren't completely in agreement with one another also entering into the fray. And even within religions, there can be kind of a separation or divisions over these issues of justice or social social justice. So trying to come at something that's kind of foundational. Uh, and Rawls is not going to come at it from his Christian background. He's, let's say, rejected that, that that won't work, that you can't create this system of justice based on a what he calls not religions but comprehensive doctrines which would which would also refer to uh comprehensive ideologies so he's about looking for a theory of justice a conception of justice as a fair system of cooperation and this will make it possible for a well-ordered society uh think the 60s you know, or think of uh, polarization, political polarization, think of our current reality, that this can be possible even in a pluralistic society where there can be these diverse worldviews, but they agree on a principle of justice and that they accept, well, the basic terms of the basic goods of society are being allocated, distributed in a fair way, and at least on that foundational idea of a society, uh, we're in agreement and we agree that it's a fair system. Um, 
So uh, this theory of justice must underlie the basic structure of society. So the question, how do we arrive at this theory of justice, this um, fair agreement, uh, this agreement on the fair terms of cooperation that offers reciprocal advantage so that nobody's left out. You don't have this radical alienation in the sense of ha- ha- having been born into a rigged system that doesn't work for them from the beginning. Uh, so this is Rawls's idea of the original position, uh, meaning it's a point of view removed from and not destroyed Started, distorted by the particular features and circumstances of the existing basic structure. So he's calling us to go back, you know, you know, almost like we go back to the Garden of Eden, or we step out of the world. And uh, some have characterized it like it's being uh, a fetus in the womb, thinking about what kind of world am I going to enter and what kind of world would I want when I don't know many things about myself. Uh, I just know that I'm uh, a human being who will live in a world with others, and I want it to be a good and a fair world. So he then comes up with this notion of the veil of ignorance, that when we think about establishing a principle of justice for our world, we step out of the world. And we develop this amnesia, total amnesia, about specifics about ourselves. We're behind the veil of interest. And this eliminates kind of bargaining to our advantages or relying on historical advantages, historical accidents of our intelligence, our education, our family background, our IQ, uh, our philosophy of life. These are all put aside. We're kind of ahistorical beings in that sense. So the original position puts us into this sphere. Uh, it's a point of view removed from and not distorted by particular features and circumstances of the basic structure of society. It's, I put this in there, is it like God's point of view? Not, not exactly. It's like this original human beings point of view. You don't know in what way or with what benefits or disadvantages you will enter the world. Uh, You can imagine yourself, well, I could be very talented and very uh, handsome and with full of abilities and have wealthy parents. And I want a world where if that happens, I can keep all of my benefits. Or you say, but you don't know. Maybe you're going to end up in the world lacking uh, intelligence. You're in not talented. You're, you're extremely mediocre or worse. And well, if that's how I turn out when I enter the playing field, may, I wouldn't want a world that disregarded me or left me just to my own devices. I'd want something, or if I were handicapped. Uh, so, uh, That's how this thought experiment allows him to develop this certain theory of justice. So in this original position, there are are a group of representatives there who are under this state of amnesia, and they come up with a theory of justice that will serve, this is Rawls' argument, as the foundation for the basic structure of society. And they kind of build this as the social contract that binds citizens uh, together. So this is called justice as, you know, the theory of justice is later called justice as fairness. And it addresses how differences in life prospects. So this, again, has to do with how you come into the world, what you inherit, how much of it is luck. You can say, oh, I really worked hard. Well, why did you have the grit and the determination uh, and the incentive to work to work hard to really fulfill and you you weren't uh, you didn't struggle with depression or a lack of uh, energy or, or intelligence or any number of talents uh, so you there's a way of understanding the world in a more sympathetic view to the 
way in which goods are distributed and a certain kind of way of seeing it as an unfairness. Uh, just like people struggle in theodicy with understanding this world that God created seems to uh, not be fair. Uh, why is there so much suffering uh, when God is so good? So this happens even in outside of theological context, for sure. Um, so his theory of justice, which is known as justice as fairness, has these simple principles. That f- the first part of it is each person has the same claim to a scheme of equal basic liberties. One of the great challenges of a theory of justice, how to balance liberty, freedoms, and equality. Because often to enforce equality, you need to restrict freedoms. Uh, or you may need to restrict someone's ability to acquire property or wealth. And you may put a limit on that, that kind of you, one side may argue, oh, you're uh, hindering my ability, my freedom to gain as much wealth as I as I would like to, and you're taking some of that wealth. We know this from taxation and progressive taxation system. But he does not, those basic liberties are sacrosanct there. He does affirm them wholeheartedly. Secondly, uh, social and economic inequalities that inevitably exist are to satisfy two conditions. First, they are attached to offices and positions open to everyone under conditions of fair equality of operation. So it's kind of open for seeking uh, your place in life and aspiring and working toward those ends. Secondly, inequalities are okay. So it's not a radical egalitarian where everyone must end up with the same outcome. So he accepts inequalities. They're okay as long as those inequalities contribute to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged members of society. This is sometimes called the maximum principle, the difference principle. Inequalities like paying doctors or inventors and their patents for money uh, is okay, as long as that is bringing great benefit to the least uh, advantaged, the least well-off, the, the, those who most lack the basic goods of society. This is his theory of justice, and it's elaborately argued in a in a very compelling and, and profound and uh, attractive way. Um, here's a quote down here I put in the script. A just society is a society that if you knew everything about it, you'd be willing to enter it in a random place, meaning random in whoever you might end up being when you walked out of this veil of interest, you say, oh, I see. I'm I'm not what I expected, but I, you know, I don't have any abilities. I may have a handicap. I I, I wasn't born very bright or whatever number of things that you'd be happy uh, and willing to live in that world and consider it a fair world because you know that whatever was happened that the sphere of liberty and even the inequalities were nonetheless you were better off in that world than any other uh system that is the base of you know this theory of justice uh so in this veil of ignorance justice as fairness focuses on inequalities in citizens life prospects I mean, that can leave you feeling hopeless. So it seeks to overcome social class of origin, native endowments, good or ill fortune, the existing uh, lottery of life and its distributions of property and cap- capital, educational background. Uh, people talk today about zip codes and certain zip codes, you know, the, the, the wealthy and intelligent are marrying together among other wealthy and intelligent, producing wealthy and intelligent children. 
uh, how to start to uh, not allow that to further polarize the the haves and the have nots. Uh, family is very important here. The quality of family care, you know, because it contributes often to uh, certain advantages that people have. So, you know, the issue of of how to uh, educate parents becomes very uh, important. And one of the ways in which justice fairness is applied is in more emphasis on education uh, for those whose life prospects are gloomy. Um, So uh, this difference principle that I mentioned before, that inequalities must contribute to the improvement of the least well off, those with the lowest life prospects. So it recognizes the inevitability, does not try to completely stop inequalities, sees them as necessary high contributors to society that that bring great benefit, uh, need incentives, and that can be acceptable so long as they contribute to others' uh, doing better and they are justifiable it says it only if they make the worst off better off then the worst off would be in any other alternative scheme uh, so how can differences in life prospects be adjusted or regulated in ways that are legitimate and consistent with the idea of free and equal citizenship in a society of fair cooperation uh, the system that he kind of advocates is property owning democracy is a term that he use, uh, uses uses uh, uh, he does not advocate the the Milton Friedman system laissez faire uh, state free to choose uh, and calls for a, a state that's more caring for looking after and recognizes the arbitrariness of many of the bases of inequality. Uh, So it can come up with laws regulating inheritance of property, taxes to prevent excessive concentrations of private power, progressive taxation, even a flat tax he discusses, uh, adjust the background conditions that have developed over time that impact the current transactions of acquiring and transferring property. So I think, uh, you know, what I've discussed with Jim Edgerly and heard from previous programs, I think this is, you know, a part of the puzzle that we can build into here. Uh, So Rawls is concerned about without being a radical or uh, suffering from the problems of socialism and communism that, disincentivize uh, by uh, extinguishing liberties, that he wants to be robust on liberties, and liberties, liberty is the first principle, and it's of higher priority than the principle that moves into equality and making sure that the least uh, are benefited from the inequalities. Um, so, you know, one analogy used like in professional sports that uh, there's a kind of an equalization after the season that the teams that did the worst get the first opportunity to uh, select new talent to help strengthen their their teams. Um, so, student the you know primary goods that citizens should be able to reasonably expect certainly their basic rights and liberties, uh, basic conditions of dignity and self respect basic income and and wealth, freedom of movement, choice of occupation, and opportunity to advance in society and obtain appropriate powers and prerogatives of offices and positions of authority and responsibility. These are the principles, again, uh, that was were mentioned earlier. So I'm going to uh, stop there. I hope my time hasn't gone over. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, there's a lot more that can be spent. I just thought to put this in the mix. Uh, I hope others can add to what I've said. I know Mr. Jessen will have a lot to say. Thank you very much. And I'll stop here. I really wish I could hear your comments and uh, corrections of things I said and uh, looks forward to the ongoing discussion. 
Okay, wonderful. Um, now, me, we could uh, probably, let me uh, get the gallery. Maybe we could probably have a little clap even for you, Dr. Walsh, not here. That was very, very well done and we appreciate that. Uh, we'll let him know about it. Um, certainly, you know, this is my first um, exposure to uh, John Rawls and, and where it's been explained. So there's a lot for me to absorb and think about as well. Some of you may have been more exposed than I am. So just uh, as we get into our discussion phase here, uh, reminder that yes, you can put the hand up for for uh, speaking. And then uh, also we have some chat and our chat moderator is Carol Polbenz. We appreciate the work that she's putting in to uh, sort through things. And you know, I might even ask uh, Carol if she has a particular chat she wants to throw up there first uh, I invite her to, to speak about that if she has one. And then um, while well, the rest of you kind of, you know, think if you have a question, I see Chris Kennedy has has a, has a his hand up. Maybe we'll start, go ahead with Chris. And then Carol, you can bring up a chat. And then uh, I did think I saw Norm Perland's physical hand go up. So he'll, we'll invite him to say a few things, but go ahead, Chris Kennedy. And if technical people, I believe can unmute you or you can unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. First, Dr. Walsh, that, I think that was really good. Thank you so much for speaking. Now, I hadn't heard about uh, Pastor Rawls until today, so I thought it was very interesting, the idea of the veil of ignorance. What I do note is, it seems to me that a merit-based society is the only incentive structure that allows for people who to benefit from other people being incentivized you know, because the general quality of society increases if people of greater ability are enacting that ability in society. But I do note that because of that, they accrue resources over time. So if you have an initially homo homogeneous distribution, that will inevitably become skewed over time. You'll get a higher Gini coefficient, right? As wealth floats into one bin or another, just on the back of people being better, at doing things and being incentivized. Is it necessary to have a cyclical uh, rehomogenization? You know, does the great hand have to come down and flatten out the territory on occasion? Or, you know, what is kind of the cyclic approach to this structure in the world? Okay, thank great. Uh, I'm gonna, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna invite up our uh, commentators kind of standing in for Dr. Walsh. We have Dr. Dr. Thomas Ward. Uh, if you can bring him to the screen too, if you're able to, and then uh, also uh, Dr. Noda, if he wants to share. So, I guess I might throw that to you, uh, Dr. Ward, if if you understood his question, or do you need that rephrased? I'd actually like to throw it to Dr. Noda if it's okay. <laughs> this is going to be a back and forth. Um... Right? <laughs> Yeah, you know, you know, my background is philosophy, so I cannot answer that question, uh, the Chris's question. But uh, I saw a couple of questions uh, I can answer uh, on the chat. So okay. may I answer that question? Yes, go, go ahead. You okay. want to re read it first? Uh, yeah. Uh, Christopher Noble, uh, under the original position starting point, people will still come up with radically different opinions, but what constitute justice? How would those differences be resolved? This is a very good question, because this is the question Michael Walter raised. And uh, rather than universalist uh, one standard, uh, he proposed multidimensional you know, approaches. Then a uh, uh, you know, conversation started between them and are still going on. And uh, uh, Chisoni uh, raised a question. Uh, Hello, Dr. Walsh. This is Chisoni. Uh, that you for your presentation, my question for you is about the justice. Michael Sandel, in his book, Justice, what is the right thing to do? Noted that justice may be approached Three, three approaches, la, 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 la. Uh, how can we really satisfy the global community drawn from various social and economic backgrounds 
for the various needs. Is it really possible to meet the needs of the masses fairly? What are your thoughts? Uh, this is again a good question raised by uh, communitarians, uh, including uh, Michael Sandel and uh, Dr. Walsh is, uh, I guess, the uh, dissertation advisor, Arasdi uh, McIntyre. The question is how you conceive human beings. Uh, John Rawls' approach is more like um, uh, universalistic, uh, atomic individual. And the McIntyre uh, sees hum views human beings as a kind of narrative. So narrative is interwoven into the narratives of the community and the societies. So in other words, human being is contextualized. So McIntyre and uh, also Michael Sandel uh, sees human beings as a being which is contextualized in the social cultural context, which is in fact diverse. And each community defines what good is, goodness is. So uh, they raise, uh, communitarians raise exactly these questions. And also one question uh, nobody raised is uh, uh, Habermas. Uh, John Rawls, uh, Habermas' argument is uh, John Rawls' discourse is more monologue, monological, you know, discourse. And uh, Habermas argues, argues that uh, it, 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 moral discourse requires dialogue and uh, public debates and a public discourse. So, uh, in fact, the the things uh, you know, our audience raised uh, resonate with the kind of questions uh, communitarians and uh, you know, Michael Walter and other uh, Habermas raised. So, I think uh, 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 this is a good starting point. Uh, to have uh, more, uh, you know, contemporary discussions, uh, which uh, John Rawls raised and others responded. So they are, you know, going back and forth. And uh, if you are interested in interested in in this topic, justice, uh, I highly recommend uh, as a starting point that uh, Michael Sandel's uh, Justice or recent book. The tyranny of merit, uh, merit rule. You know, tyranny of merit is speaking of he's he's speaking about the meritocracy, and how it harms the, uh, especially in the U.S. So, okay, yeah. Anyway, yes, thank you, yeah, thank you, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Are there? I don't see any other hands uh, raised, so I'm going to go over to Mr. Norman Curland who is the, uh, I know Norm, he's the president of the Center for Economic and Social Justice, and uh, his concept is dear to his heart. So Norm, do you wanna briefly comment or have a question? Really brief, right. I, I, I think the presentations were excellent. I, 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 there's nothing that was said that I would disagree with. However, uh, something has to be added and that is money the money system, to what extent could the money system be democratized so that every citizen would have equal access to money to buy newly issued shares re reflecting uh, the artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, and many other job-displacing technologies. But the, the, we're talking there in 3 to $4 trillion a year. And if you divided it by the population, it would be about $10,000 for every child from the time of birth. Every woman, every man would have an equal access to capital credit, not based on past savings, but future savings. In other words, this was not my idea. This was Lewis Kelso. And we were able to get laws uh, so that uh, workers 
the the ESOPs, I I happen to have written the initial laws for ESOPs and and have enabled a company in which the workers were able to buy out the company from the original owners here in Washington, uh, uh, Mid-South Building Supply. Nobody put up a penny. It was all done on bank credit. But we want to go further than that. It's not workers, but we're all consumers. And there's no reason that you can't have a money system, which was developed by Lewis Kelso in, in, in his writings in, and uh, three books on our uh, website at cesj.org. Uh, and, and a law called the Economic Democracy Act, in which there are proposed changes to the money system and, and, and some tax changes and inheritance changes. But the primary thing is money. And I didn't hear anything said about money, but I think it would be valuable for anyone who is trying to find a new answer, a new tool that can be universally accessible without taking any property away from existing owners. Everyone from the richest to the poorest would have an equal allocation of capital credit to purchase newly issued shares representing growth and have it paid for out of the earnings of that capital. Wow. So anyway, that's the, I, I, I want to add that uh, because I'm not sure I heard anything about money. No, I think I think you're right. That wasn't uh, explicitly, we, it was talked about property ownership and, uh, and capital. But um, we might hear more of that, uh, hopefully uh, at a later time as we dig into this topic further. Um, I want to just check with you, Chris Kennedy. Did you get an answer to your question or uh, maybe uh, not? I think maybe uh, there were other questions in the chat that were more okay uh, interesting at the moment. Okay. But I also understand that I asked a very difficult question. <laughs> so, you know, maybe I have to okay. warm up to that. It might take okay. a while. Okay, we're doing our best here. Uh, Leslie Rigney, I see your hand is up. What do you have a question or comment you'd like to address? Yeah, I, this is a very interesting topic, and I was just floored at the statistics that James Edgerly presented. Uh, this is just totally unacceptable, and I don't know how it's going to change. Um, I know that that in our movement we talk a lot about education. And how do we educate the people that are in the 1% to care enough about others or even to know what they could do to be helpful? But one thing that, that comes to mind is the whole idea of family. And that they, the, the kids that are most successful are the ones who have strong families. And yet there's so many pressures on families these days that if there could be something that could help to relieve these pressures, some more government support for families, uh, that perhaps this would be one way of approaching it. Um, but it certainly is a problem that needs to be solved. I'm, I'm very impressed. And I appreciate some of the ideas that um, Dr. War, uh, Dr. Walsh presented. Uh, but there again, it's very, on the theoretical side, <laughs> How do we bring it down to earth? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, it, okay, I see a, a couple of hands up. And, and a, I don't know how you bring a hand down, but uh, <laughs> very good. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, Carol, before I go to Peter Hayes, Carol, is there anything in the chat that you'd like to uh, you think is... Uh, needing of an answer of Dr. Ward or uh, Professor Noda? Yeah, and uh, David Pear has uh, a comment up there that um, is worth some consideration. Are we suggesting that the government be the agency by which the equal opportunity be achieved through taxation and policy implementation 
or are we suggesting that there be a greater force of conscience uh, which also came up from somebody else's comment. I think it was uh, Ilio Roman was asking about conscience generated somehow through a social movement to direct those of uh, uh, great wealth to actively seek a more just or equal system. Okay. Dr. Ward, you, you would like to give some thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I'm happy, I'm happy to share uh, a few thoughts. If, if I could, first of all, just say a few things about the, um, James Edgeley's presentation, I think that might that might help sure. too. That might help a little bit because, um, anyway, I I was fortunate to have both Alan and 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 uh, and James uh, with me in a class last term. They were they were really co-instructors more than students. So it was nice to have them there. But uh, um, what I wanted to say is. Uh, I, there's no question about this massive economic disequilibrium that James Edgerly points to. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I don't want Marx to get too much credit for that. <laughs> because uh, in reality, Marx's notion of a concentration of capital was, uh, was not what we're talking about tonight. Marx had a very simplistic, lived in a simplistic world and had a simplistic worldview. And in that in that worldview, uh, basically, the concentration of capital was meant to uh, control the means of production or or machinery, if you will. That was that was pretty much everything in his in his world. And his prediction, his prediction of one hundred and sixty one years ago was that we were just about on the brink of that system collapsing. Because the concentration of capital uh, was going to lead to a decrease of profits, because machinery, in 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 uh, in Marx's axiomatic viewpoint, can never produce profits, uh, would uh, would lead to a decrease of profits and to an increase of poverty, because over a period of time, machinery would replace. Uh, all laborers that and uh, that would be kind of where things would there that things would stay now Lizette Kolakowski probably one of the greatest uh, authorities on, on Marxism in, you know in in his lifetime that there was he points out that even in capital Marx after about 1850 no longer cited any statistics about uh, reduction in uh in uh labor wages because they were increasing unlike today as as James points out we've and and I didn't I didn't that's one of the things I was grateful to have him in our class because he did point out the fact that wages haven't increased for a number of years at all there's been no increase of wages although enormous wealth is, has 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 grown and and been generated but in terms of in terms of comparatively nothing has happened there however I do want to emphasize that uh, you might want to think about using a different term, James, than concentration of capital. Uh, I think, and, and and but the 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 concern that you point to, as Leslie just ob observed, is a is a very real one. But uh, it was not something that Marx actually is is the one responsible for discovering. You know, you may be more of a discoverer of that phenomenon than Marx. <laughs> <laughs> His, his 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 worldview at that time and and the factors that he considered in 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 the produ production process were very very limited just a few things okay good yeah nice to have that kind of uh clarification or another perspective on that uh there was a question carol do you want to kind of restate that question there was the question of conscience where does the the concept of conscience come in uh, into this discussion. Okay, that's a that's another. Yeah, that's another another important, forum. <laughs> that's an important concept, by the way, developed by another very famous thinker. But I think his views maybe are still relevant today. And I'm talking about Adam Smith. You know, Adam Smith is so well known for his for his book. Uh, you know, an in inquiry in into the cause of the wealth of nations. But uh, 17 years before he wrote that book in 1859, he wrote the theory of moral sentiments. 
which was was a book that he was very dedicated to. Actually, uh, he he edited and re-edited that text almost until the day he died, from 1759 until 1791, 1790. There were re-edits of that text because it was a very important text. And what he spoke about, it, it relates to what David Paris says, what he spoke about was that there's something inside of human beings, which he referred to as the impartial spectator. And it was something that guided people to know, and it's kind of almost like almost like conscience, to know what is right and what is wrong. And he was not he was not a, a big fanatic about the so-called invisible hand. I think the invisible hand is mentioned four times in the Wealth of Nations, but he was very serious about this impartial spectator and that people would act based upon their moral judgments in determining what they did and did not do. And I think that that's a piece that really is fundamental to, to our society. It's the role of the individual. It's the role of conscience, if you will, in determining what we do. And I, th I think also that's what motivates people like, uh, like Alan and James and, and Norm and so many others, that the reality is there is this conscience which tells us this isn't right. We have to do something to find a solution to this. But that was one of the great things about, about Smith. By the way, it's, it's not, he lived his life that way. He was a very, very moral person, you know. Even at some point, he was called off to France to, 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 uh, to tutor two, two of, uh, one, of the, one, of, one, of, one of the members of the, of the British royalty. He, he, he went there as, as, their, as their tutor, if you will. And he was teaching at that time at the University of Glasgow. And he came in and he took his he took the money that that he had received for the year and he returned everything that would cover the part of the year that he that he was not going to be there. And they go, what are you doing that for? He said, I'm doing it because it's the right thing. I have to do that. You know, so I think this whole matter of there, there's something to be learned in the theory of moral sentiments that that part of Smith, I'm amazed by, quite frankly, uh, and, and, uh, and I think there's something to be learned there. Yeah, thank you. And that's, that fits into with the idea of the base, the base being the culture and the ideas. Uh, here's James, your hand is up. You'd like to respond to some of this? Yes, uh, the issue raised by Elio and David Payer of uh, conscience. Um, in my opinion, I don't have any empirical evidence for this, but I think the conscience to, uh, and the, peop the level of concern about this is already present. It's widespread. People are aware of it. My children are aware of it. My neighbors are aware of it. I think the, the thing that's not the thing that's missing is not people's troubled conscience. I think it's leadership. I think it's ideas, it's proposals to address this issue. I, I believe that that's the missing ingredient. I think the conscience of our country is well prepared to deal with this this question. And the question that comes up from David on is it. Is it a government policy of redistribution? The idea that interests me the most and higher purpose form the most is not is not a proposal for government redistribution. It's the proposal that comes out of uh, uh, most recently CESJ with Dr. Curlin is this whole issue about trying to set up a system like an ESOP system at the macro level which allows ownership to be much more broadly distributed, widely distributed, systematically distributed, so that everyone gets to participate in the growing wealth of our country, not by a government redistribution, but by people being given the opportunity to participate in ownership, which they're being denied because of certain issues with money. Yeah. Right, Norman? That's right. You have. <laughs> He's been a good student. <laughs> I I think no, this the, is, this the, is right. the deficit is in leadership, in my opinion. Yeah, you know it fits in. I'm going to call Peter in a minute here, Peter. But but I was just thinking about what uh, get to get back to Rawls a little bit since uh, uh, Dr. Walsh brought us into this, uh, this understanding of Wal uh, Dr. Rawls. Focusing on an agreement, he was he was searching for this agreement between citizens on um, you know the need for this this is 
kind of a new social contract. Actually, let's update the social contract with the, yes. with the discussion of justice as part of it, not just uh, only in, in political uh, power sharing, but in, in, in power sharing that comes from a more equitable or more uh, democratic economic system. But I think that fits in with what Rawls was saying. Um, okay, Peter, Peter you have, Hayes, you've had your hand up there. You share your question. Sure. Hey, wonderful, wonderful discussion. It's more of a comment than a question, but um, I think um, when I came across CSJ and worked with them last 12, 15 years, um, I've coined what we're talking about as head wing economics. So you have on the left, you have institutionalized greed, envy, excuse me, take away from existing. Then on, you know, monopoly crony capitalism is institutionalized greed. And both greed and envy are vices. But justice is seen universally as a virtue. So the just third way, a justice-based economic system that literally empowers 100% citizen ownership. And it's very practical when you go to the csj.org website. This is not no pie in the sky, glory when we die. This is very practical <laughs> in law and politics. Here's something that came up recently. You probably have seen that. 65, 70% of Democrats and 65, 70% of Republicans both feel that their party is not helping them economically. Hmm, interesting. Both, so a vast, vast majority are saying, well, yeah, I'm a Republican, but guess what? The party's not helping me, not putting a, a dime in my pocket. And that's for Democrats. <laughs> so the latest numbers are 40% self identify as independents. 27% as Democrats on the left, 25% on Republicans. So this headwing economics and politics that we've kind of coined, and I'm using the term, it's an idea whose time has come. Peter, right. thank you. Peter, you 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 sound like someone who could be uh, a candidate for president for the United <laughs> Party. That's better days with Peter Hayes for president. You got it. <laughs> okay, okay, good. Um, what do you think about that idea of the social contract, uh, Doctor Ward? Should we? Uh, does it? Does it? Is what Rawls is saying it seem to imply that it needs to be an updated? discussion and uh, you know and as jim mentioned leadership leading us in a more of a uh, uh unified approach and understanding of where we're going uh you well first of all let me just say i really appreciated uh, dr walsh's presentation tonight yeah. today i think we got to keep in mind that in his presentation what he really did was he introduced us to to rawl's thought he didn't necessarily say this is my thought, but he did introduce us to John Rawls' complete thought. So I, I greatly appreciated that. Um, the social contract is uh, is a big thing, right? Uh, the the U.S. Constitution was was a social contract, and and if if if, uh, if we go back to Thomas Hobbes, it's almost like the first the first social contract wasn't necessarily something that was conscience. Conscious. It was just a group of people that were intimidated, intimidated and felt unsafe and made a determination that they would be willing to sacrifice a certain number of their freedoms because they felt that if they didn't do those things, then it would become it would become uh, very difficult to uh, to survive or to even secure the safety and the well-being of their own families. So um the, the social contract is a very big question, I mean, I, I feel, and, and I, I don't know if Dr. Walsh was intending to say that, that that's what we need to, to explore right now. Uh, hopefully, the things that, that, uh, that uh, Dr. Kerland is, is, has proposed for decades and that uh, you, Alan, and James, and um, Peter are talking about Hopefully, these are things that can be done within the system as it exists. We don't need sure. necessarily to have a, a a new social contract because that that is an awesome task and it puts a lot of things at risk. Quite mm, frankly, I see. Okay, thank you. I see the hand of uh, Gordon Anderson. I was almost going to call on you, Gordon, because uh, I knew you might have something to add here. But uh, welcome to the to the discussion, Gordon. What a surprise that Gordon raised his hand. 
uh, yeah. Well, uh, it's a topic of interest. I, you know, I studied with the Reinhold Niebuhr Scholar at Union Seminary, and John Rawls got ideas from Niebuhr. Uh, but uh, Tom, uh, Tom Ward raised the Adam Smith's idea of the impartial observer, and Tom Walsh talked about the veil of ignorance. Those two themes sounded a lot like like they're almost the same topic because they talk about an individual looking at the world as an individual from a position of fairness based on his conscience. Uh, but the problem that we have today in our political system is that it isn't individuals based on their conscience that's making the decisions. Political parties don't have a conscience. Political parties uh, are, are basically vehicles for special interests yeah. to shape <laughs> legislation and get around citizen input and get around the consent to the governed. So I, I see, uh, yes, we can live within the specific social contract we have, but we have to undo an awful lot of, of uh, get arounds that the uh, parties have done to game the system that we have. And uh, until we can get some of that institutional power out of the system of governance, uh, I don't think we can, you know, bring back this veil of ignorance. Okay, very good. Well, we're all, thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, we're almost at our end here. And I, I think I might invite any final comments from you, Jim, but also uh, Dr. Noda, is there anything you'd like to, Add from uh, listening in to the uh, discussion, and and of course, Dr. Ward too. If you have anything you'd like to speak, see, I'm I'm happy to just make one comment if I could. Sure, go ahead. I'd like to just go quickly go to Steve Bole's comment six fifty seven fifty two. Can you address the division that is growing between those on the left who demand equality of outcome and those on the right who are pushing for equality of opportunity? I would just like to say that the Rawls, as I understand it, the Rawls proposal is really on the side of, it's actually, it's actually more uh, benevolent than, but it's on the side of equal opportunity. Because his his when he talks about uh, uh, equal position and and uh, office, what he's saying is that everyone does deserve equal opportunity, but equal opportunity isn't enough. We do have we have to have a society where equal opportunity is available to for everyone. And his big emphasis there is on education. But he says even if you grant equal opportunity, if you if you let everyone start the same starting point in a race, the people who for, for no, no, no reason of their own who were just born stronger and faster are going to win the race by a lot every time. So his concept of justice has to do with fairness to help people who received unequal or unfair endowments still receive a fair, a, their fair share of benefits from a wealthy system. So it is as a system of equal opportunity, not equal outcomes, equal opportunity with additional fairness for disadvantaged people that we can all share in the benefits of a private uh, freedom-based economy. Yes, <clears throat> and I think about the first slide he had up there as well, where he used the word distributive justice as a, as a you know, virtue and as a concept that we need to implement as, as well as the participative justice that you talked about there. Okay. I'm, his basic his basic motto is is justice as fairness. Yeah. Yeah. Based on uh, an agreement of people that you can get to that point. Yes. Where you can be people of conscience. Yeah, it's very good. I think it was very very helpful for myself and others. Um, again, I'd off, offer any final comments to either one of uh, our uh, commentators here from HJI. I just like well. to express my appreciation uh, for tonight's program. I think it's been a it's been a great program, and I, I thank you for 
serving as the moderator, Alan Jessen. Thank you for your very fine presentation, uh, James Edgley, reminding us about uh, about our current circumstance and and the, the need to, the, we can't just ignore it. We can't continue to ignore it. And I thank you, Dr. Kerlin, for your work for so many <laughs> decades. And uh, yeah, you've you you you've lived this night and day. And so we uh, and I thank you for inspiring uh, so many. I want to say so many of our young people, but they're not young people anymore. So. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I'm, I thank you so much for inspi inspiring so many, so Hi. many of us by by uh, your great work. And I also just want to express my my gratitude to Dr. Walsh because I th I think this was really a magisterial presentation Thanks. tonight on uh, John Rawls and uh, really a, a a chance for all of us to uh, to learn and deepen our insights in this area. And thank you, uh, Dr. Noda, for being able to kind of uh, mentor us through this uh, tonight. And uh, um, Dr. Mentor, uh, Dr. Dr. Mentor, <laughs> Dr. Noda is is really to, um, a first class philosopher who really looks at the deep questions, and we're blessed to have him at HJI. Thanks to everyone who joined us tonight, and thanks to Hyper Prior Purpose Forum for partnering in this important event. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, and. Uh, I'd like to add then to to the uh, let everybody know who's on the line here today that the April conference will include discussions uh, going deeper into this area. And I think Norm and his group is going to have one part of the presentation to explain a little bit how their system uh, can actually bring a systemic, you know, uh, change uh, without redistribution. So I think that's what. Yeah you know, is interesting to everyone, certainly to me, that if you can in, in, uh, solve some of the flaws in the distributed model that we have, then how much greater that would be than leading into a political fight for uh, redistribution money. So uh, and, hopefully- and I, think that, I think that answers Chris Kennedy's question from the beginning of the conversation. He said that perhaps the way it has to be done is a periodic flattening of of maldistribution, but that actually the proposal is the opposite of that. The pro proposal is to allow more people to benefit in the future, yeah. the future prosperity exactly. of our country. Exactly. To spread. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, no I'm not, I didn't interrupt. Is that it, Jim? Is you, yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. And we will be discussing capital. So, capital concentration. Thank you, guys, everyone. Um, thank you for Carol for helping. And uh, I guess we're going to sign off here tonight from Higher Purpose Forum. See you again in the future. Thanks so much. Yeah.